Uh, good afternoon. I'm Steve Thompson, the Vice Chair of the Hennepin Healthcare Board of Directors. And on behalf of our Chair, Kathy Thunheim, and all of the Board Directors, I want to welcome you today. I'm uh, reconvening the Board meeting that we just had as a transition into our 2023 annual meeting. I'd like to welcome those of you who have joined us in person and those who are attending virtually. As we get started today, I want to thank the Whittier Clinic leadership for hosting us today. It's a wonderful facility, and uh, we're, we're so happy to be here. First, some housekeeping. If you have any questions as we go along and you're attending virtually, please put them in the Q&A on the Zoom uh, chat. If we don't get to all of the questions, we'll post a recording of this meeting online with a summary of questions and comments that we receive. So we'll get to all of them. You'll find that you'll find that at hennepinhealthcare.org slash annual meeting. Again, hennepinhealthcare.org slash annual meeting. In a moment, we'll start with a video that looks at our year in review. That will be followed by an update on our community health assessment, community health needs assessment work. Uh, then we'll learn about a groundbreaking program here at the Whittier Clinic followed by an update on our clinical design and campus planning work. A lot going on uh, at HHS. Jennifer will then have some comments on the current situation facing healthcare providers, and then we'll have some time for Q&A, again, both for people here in the room and those who are joining us virtually online. So let's take a look at the video, at the video of a year uh, look back.
Well, as you can see, there's been a lot going on, and I hope you get a sense of how deeply integrated and committed HHS is to the community. Since this is an extension of our regularly scheduled meeting of the Hennepin Healthcare System Board of Directors, I wanted to start by introducing the board. I think that should be coming up. Anyway, they are community leaders who give their talents and time as volunteer directors of the healthcare system. While we're getting that up, I'll read the names. The board members are Babette Applin, Jennifer D. Cubellis, the CEO, Commissioner Irene Fernando, Jacob Gale, Commissioner Marion Green, Brock Nelson, Mohammed Omar, Chris Peterson, Arthi Prasad, myself, Diana Vance Bryan, Craig Warren, who's here tonight, as well as Tom Wyatt and David Ibarra. They put a lot of time and passion into their service on this board and our community is grateful for their dedication. I would also like to note that four, four of our board members have reached the end of their consecutive terms and will be leaving the board in January. Special thanks to Jacob, Chris, Diana, and David for their many years of service. I wanted to go on to the um, recognize the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners. Hennepin Healthcare System is a subsidiary corporation of Hennepin County, and the county board approves the corporation's annual budget and has other responsibilities per our bylaws. As you saw, Chair Fernando and Commissioner Green currently serve on the Hennepin Healthcare Board. Thank you also to Commissioners Lundy, Conley, Gettle, and Anderson for their ongoing partnership and support of Hennepin Healthcare. Our community is involved with our healthcare system today more than ever. We have community members who serve on our board committees, the Research Institute Board, and the Foundation Board, as well as the Community Advisory Board of the Health System. Thank you to all who share their time and talents by serving on these boards and committees. Now I'd like to ask CEO Jennifer DeCubellis to introduce her executive team and lead us through the rest of our program this afternoon. Jennifer. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to get that kind of attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve, uh, for kicking us off. And I want to just say thank you to our entire board of directors who are in the room today uh, for their dedicated service. If you're not aware, this is a volunteer board, and they put in incredible amounts of hours, time, energy, and above all, compassion to make sure at the end of the day, Hennepin Healthcare is doing right by the communities we serve. And I think you saw that highlighted throughout the video, not just the incredible services we provide, but the involvement, the engagement, and making sure that what matters most to our community is always at the forefront. With that, I wanna also recognize our executive leadership team. They guide the organization daily as it seeks to fulfill its critical mission with the community. We have Lisa Anderson, Ann Reynolds, Dr. Cedarstrom, Dr. Schmidt, Karen Strawman, Wendy stulak matzel and Dr. Walsh. These are leaders who demonstrate a tireless commitment to the organization, to our team members, and to the community we serve, while also being incredible thought leaders across Minnesota and even across the nation when it comes to safety net healthcare research, academic medicine, and care for the community. Our mission for Hennepin Healthcare is to partner with our community, our patients, and their families to ensure access to outstanding care for everyone, while improving health and wellness through teaching, patient, and community education and research. We do that in many ways. We do that through our hospital, our clinics, our emergency service ambulances that you'll see out in the community, and we do it in people's homes across Hennepin County and telephonically through telehealth across the entire state of Minnesota. Here's a couple of stats just to talk about the number of lives we touch. In a year that is comprised of over 670,000 clinic visits, 16,000 500 people treated in our inpatient unit. 
87,700 emergency department visits. It's an incredibly busy place. 89,500 ambulance runs and 1,700 births. Partnered with Incredible Care, we are also a large provider of medical education as one of the primary residency and fellowship training sites for the University of Minnesota Medical School. And in addition to that, we sponsor 22 of our own residency and fellowship programs with more than 260 residents and fellows each year coming through our walls. We work with more than 140 hospitals, colleges, universities, and other facilities to provide clinical training. The impact for Hennepin Healthcare is not just here in the Whittier neighborhood. It is across the state of Minnesota and in many realms with our teaching across the nation. We are an important part of the solution for healthcare and the crisis of staffing as we train and we bring more into healthcare. I wanna extend my thanks to the Whittier Clinic that we're in today for those of you that are in person, to their leadership team and staff for hosting us today. As I pulled in earlier today, it's a busy place. Uh, parking lot is full, care happening throughout the building and incredible smiles on faces as they exited after getting care here. Whittier Clinic has been here since 2010 and previously was serving patients out of the Family Medicine Center on Lake Street. You can see some of their statistics here. They offer an array of primary care and specialty care, plus imaging and many community services. I will say over my past four years here at Hennepin Healthcare, um, it was here that they stood up a place when the Lake Street Clinic was burned in civil unrest. They took in their colleagues, they took in the community, they took in the patients. It was here that we had ceremonies in honoring George Floyd. It was here that the lines were out the door for COVID vaccinations. And it was here that telehealth and group work kept community connected during the past three really challenging years. A little later, we're gonna hear about a program, Akiparate, a service here at Whittier that meets the needs of Latinx parents and teens, a program grown up through the community for the community. Before we jump into that, I wanna talk a little bit about our public policy leadership. Hennepin Healthcare is able to meet the unique and emerging needs of our community in part thanks to the strong support we receive from our legislators. There were some key legislative partnerships that have allowed us to accomplish some great things in the past. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge them. A couple of them are online with us, Senator, Kelly Morrison and Representative Patty Akam, I believe have joined us virtually tonight. They led efforts in creating medical assistance coverage for recuperative care services. And if you're not aware, this is a short-term care, typically located in a shelter or other short-term transitional housing for people experiencing homelessness that are not ill enough that they need our ongoing inpatient care, but they're not well enough to go back to unstable housing. Through advocacy and partnership with them, recuperative care is now a reality here in Minnesota. They made a difference by reducing higher cost care, unnecessary hospitalizations, and more intensive medical care for our unhoused patients. In my eyes, this is smart government, lower cost and better outcomes. So we wanna say thank you to them for that ongoing partnership. Senator Omar Fateh and Representative Aaron Cagle. And I believe Representative Cagle is here in the room with us today. Thank you, in the back of the room. Helped us to secure ongoing funding for our Addiction Medicine Fellowship Program that we partner with the University of Minnesota on. And it's the only one of its kind in the state. If anyone has watched the headlines, addiction is increasing creating fellowships, creating workforce opportunities, using our research, our teaching capacity to expand our ability to treat addiction is essential. Your support for this funding is critical to addressing the shortage of addiction provider specialists and expanding prevention and treatment of substance use disorders 
So thank you. And it is ongoing funding. Thank you for that. That is essential. Good plug. Really good plug. Uh, sometimes we get grants and those can be tough because you go session by session. It is ongoing funding that added this benefit set to Medicaid, which means it's available and it's in our stand, state plan on an ongoing basis. And lastly, I'd like to do a shout out to Senators Zanab Mohammed and Representative Mohammed Nord, who helped us secure funding for our telementoring program. Project ECHO, Dr. Prasad is in the room with us today as one of the champions for that program as well. Hennepin Healthcare remains the site of the most ECHO programs and the highest participation count in the state. Thank you for the support of this program. It transforms how providers can treat their patients through shared clinical knowledge, taking our teaching footprint, putting it into an accessible mode where other health systems, other providers, people across the state of Minnesota, and people even in our community who provide ancillary supports can learn from the best of the best, can spread treatments and best practices that are working. As a teaching health system, we are spreading those best practices across the state of Minnesota and expanding our teaching capacity beyond our walls. I am so grateful for the partnership and the hard work of the legislators, for our legislative advocates and our policy team that helps make sure that the needs of our community are heard and not just heard, but responded to every single day. One of the primary purposes of our annual meeting is to report out on our community progress. Our community health needs assessment is a, an assessment that happens every three years. It's a formal structure that allows us to engage with community to hear what matters most to them for their healthcare needs. Like all hospitals, we work through this process every three years where we turn to our neighborhoods, our cities, where the majority of our patients live and we engage intentionally in a community-driven process to gather insights from the communities we serve. This leads to an action plan and initiatives. And I'd like to ask our population health liaison, Laura Bowen, to provide an update on this work. Laura? Hello, thank you for letting me join you today. My name is Laura Bowen. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here to give you an update on the community health needs assessment implementation work. The community health needs assessment helps us to meet a federal requirement for nonprofit hospitals, as well as fulfilling our unique local requirement for a health services plan. As Jennifer said, it's a community engaged process. It involves interviews with community members, surveys of staff, uh, public prioritization events, and working with a core team of community members to synthesize the results and co-create, co-write our implementation plan. We are so thankful to everybody who participated in all of those efforts. And I wanna say a particular thank you to Aida Strom and Pat Schaffner for leading those efforts for the 2022 assessment. The core team came up with this guiding principle as it relates to our process and work. It says to build and foster trust, community health needs assessment implementation work will prioritize working collaboratively with the communities we serve through two-way conversations, partnerships, co-creation, and transparency. And that principle is important not only for the process of how we do the assessment, but also for every action item in our implementation plan. So what is in our implementation plan? The community identified three priority needs. Number one, accessibility to health and safety as a human right. Number two, comprehensive equitable education, and number three, advocacy and cultural sensitivity. You can see under each of uh, the prioritized needs some specific actions the community wants us to partner with them to advance health in our community. Financial access, reproductive care, addressing the impacts of stress and trauma and systemic racism, providing culturally relevant care and health education, building two-way communication channels with our community partners, hiring more providers who reflect the community we serve, hiring more community members, including elders, helping people navigate our healthcare system to receive care, and hiring cultural navigators to be a bridge between providers and patients and providing culturally relevant care options. Uh, this is a very high level overview of what's actually in the implementation plan, uh, just for brevity's sake, but there'll be a link at the end of the presentation if you'd like to actually see the full action list. 
I wanted to give just, again, a few highlights. There's so much in this implementation plan, but a few things that the community asked us to work on that we um, achieved some real success in 2023. So our health equity team has grown, including the five cultural navigators, as well as uh, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion coaches that are available to all staff. And our entire uh, HHS staff continues to participate in cohorts of our COMPASS program, a year-long journey where Hennepin healthcare team members receive the chance to reflect, learn, and connect with other employees focusing on racial inequities in our healthcare system. Our talent garden, as you saw in the video, continues to promote healthcare careers to BIPOC youth through internships and events like American Indian and Black Women Youth and Stethoscopes events. And then as we just heard, um, some important updates on trauma-informed care. Uh, our East Lake Clinic hired a trauma-informed care coordinator as part of their efforts to fully integrate trauma-informed care into the entire clinic. And we also received legislative funding to begin a trauma-informed care and health equity ECHO. Um, and as, as Jennifer mm -hmm. was explaining the ECHO model, it's this mentorship telemedicine program where we're really able to take best practices and disseminate them throughout the community. And I love uh, the ECHO approach of all teach, all learn. It's really in line with the principles behind our community health needs assessment work. I wanted to give, a, again, a particular highlight of the cultural navigators. This was something the community specifically asked us for, and it's one way that we're fulfilling our commitment to them. Uh, this role is unique and complementary to all of our other amazing, amazing staff at HHS who support our patients. Our cultural navigators represent African American, Native American, Latin A, and Somali backgrounds and serve as a partner to both patients and staff in tailoring care, providing holistic, physical, emotional, and spiritual support. They are also building relationships with community partners and working on providing culturally relevant health education in community settings. I wanted to share just a few patient quotes from folks who've been working with our cultural navigator team. Uh, muchas gracias por todo, for your help and your patience. I'm very grateful for you caring for my mother and keeping an eye on her and her situation, especially in these difficult and new moments for us. You just reaching out regarding therapists, taking a moment to help find a therapist that would work for me and taking the time to sit with me and hear my story. You understood what I needed and took the time. You were such a sweetheart and that makes all the difference to me. You created a space for me here to be able to smudge and to do stuff in my room that I would be able to do at home. You bring smudge for me to be able to take home and that makes me happy. You advocate for me to the doctors. So again, this was a very brief overview. I wanna thank you for your time today. If you'd like to see the full plan and learn more about me, learn more about um, about all of the ways that we are continuing to implement our priorities, please look at our website. We did just add a ton of great information about real time ways we are working on these. And then if you are interested in partnering on any of these priorities, my contact information is here and I would love to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it is incredibly deep work, and this is our accountability to be able to report out to community, but there is a whole work plan that holds us accountable to making sure we're moving the line. So thank you for your leadership in that work. Now I want to move us into focusing on one program centered right here at the Whittier Clinic that is a shining example of what happens when we listen to community, when we understand a unique set of needs, and respond in a way that in this situation has earned acclaim and national attention since it was launched 20 years ago, which is somewhat incredible that it's still innovative today uh, in the work that uh, Dr. Maria Veronica Svetas has created. Aki Parte is Spanish for here for you. And I will not say it with that wonderful accent that you're gonna hear Dr. Svetas say. Uh, she created this approach for delivering services to children and parents simultaneously, and she's going to join me today. She had wanted to be in the room. Um, unfortunately, because of illness, she will be joining us on Zoom. So we're going to see how this goes, uh, just to hear a little bit more about the program. Dr. Svetaz, do we have you online? I'm here, and I don't know if you can see me. I can see you, and I can see me. So hopefully that will work for everyone else here. I can imagine and you're looking great. 
Uh, we're going to just dialogue a little bit for a few moments uh, to have Dr. Svetas talk to us about the Akaparati program. And uh, about 20 years ago, you identified a need for a new way to deliver care to this community, to address the disparities that we see every single day in healthcare. Can you tell us a little bit about what you created and how it addresses those disparities? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I wanted to say, to share with you after, first of all, I want to be grateful to all of you, to our board leaders, our Hennepin leaders, our communities, our representative, our senator, everyone who made possible everything that we do, right? Particularly in Akiparati. And um, I wanted to share with you, like actually Akiparati turned 21. So think about that, right? When you're caring for adolescents and young adults, right? So Akiparati can drink. Akiparati, it's now like a, gaining more agency and being able to to become more like an adult, right? So it, it's fascinating to me to be here today with all of you. So to your question, I when I think about how did we get this in a way right, right? I think it was like the intentionality and to have the ability to do active listening with our community. I'm so thankful like the community have spoken and talking about having... Um, to be able to have healthcare as a human right. Because when I finished my time at the university, right, with all my training, my fellowship, and my master in public health, I thought like for once in my own, on my own values, right? It was like human right. Healthcare is a human right. Being healthy, it's a human right. So I wanted to be located in there where this is not a barrier. And the second piece was that it was clear to me, like the research processes, how we were creating knowledge was not condescent to, to fulfill the needs that our communities were having, right? Like it was impossible to really translate things that were so, um, they were buffering the unmet needs that the community were having. So I felt like it needed to be done through the community. So the way that we have done it was like making sure that we were mapping two pieces of, of the Akiparati. One was the unmet needs that we were finding in the community. And by unmet needs, it's a definition that we use in health equity. When we are trying to refer to those needs that the community shouldn't have, right? And the other piece was like looking at the processes and the barriers that we were creating with the design that we were having in our own healthcare, particularly back in 2001, right? Think about this, right? Right in this grant in 2001. And being a healthcare that we were not putting a lot of emphasis on patient-physician collaboration, right? We were not putting a lot of emphasis on the importance of cultural responsiveness and also the, on privilege and oppression, right? And we were having, in fact, like a design, a healthcare design that was centered to the values and preference to those in with more privilege, more in the mainstream at the center, right? And know those communities that were has that, that were has been that were being historically marginalized. And for once, trauma didn't get trauma meaning trauma responsive care, right? The trauma that comes um, with being historically marginalized, and the fact that you as growing sometimes were experiencing certain adverse events in your life that were creating a different way for you on how you will engage and create trust with the people that you needed to trust the most. So with that in mind, we created this map that you see here, right? So we needed to put emphasis on access when, you know, Latina communities are the ones who love access to healthcare the most. Uh, so that's why Akiparati was born in a federal, federally qualified um healthcare center, and then we transfer the program to an amazing safety net. Language and cultural barriers were a fact. So 100% of our team, it's bilingual. 80 or 100, it belongs to the culture or they are culturally responsive. We have like serious mental health inequities in our community, not inherited by biology, right? In the community, but the fact that the complexity that our team has to face. They are born in transnational families. They have family with mixed status families. They have to blossom under two different cultures, right? And who have like different definition of success. 
they need to learn to navigate during this, sometimes more than one, right? Cultural words. And their awakening, it's an awakening that sometimes is like pain with the fact like they are realizing like they don't have the same access that their peers and they're treated in a different way like their peers. And all these challenges create different needs in mental health, right? This trauma and stress create different needs in mental health. So that is worst when you're living in a predominantly white state. That has been widened and increased after COVID-19 because COVID-19 was a syndemic, right? It was not only the virus, it was like realizing that the health inequities that we have in existence in our community grew uh, stronger, right, and deeper. And particularly for use of color after the murdering of Mr. Floyd, right? So we need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to the sec sexual health inequity that you see right there. Latina teen pregnancy was connected to lack of hope. And it was not a mainstream, um, I'll say, knowledge, right? Uh, people were thinking like we were having these rates of pregnancy due to lack of access, when in reality it was like tied with, with their hope and the inability to achieve the things that they wanted to do the most, right? So it was really tied with education and being seen and being celebrated. Achievement gap, I don't know, most of you know, I particularly are representatives and senators, like we have in Minnesota a very stubborn achievement gap. It's called also the opportunity gap by the community, which means like on time high school graduation is different. For communities of color, we are the worst for Latina teens, but we are the second worst for African-American, the third world for Asian, the fourth world for Native American, right? So it's a question about being different and, and and teaching to those and seeing those who are different and responding to, to their world. So we have social economic inequities. So that's why like triaging social economical needs as part of what we do is so instrumental. And then we have like this micro and microaggression, bias, discrimination, and stereotyping that become another pandemic, right? I call it, talk about that, the pandemic of hate in the last years. Uh, and when we did an ease assessment with our teens and our parents, they talk about, this was around 2011, they talk about how the, the bias, discrimination, and stereotyping was more challenging to them than the social economical barrier. Think about that. I cried that day because I thought like they didn't know this, right? So, and the way that we do it, right? So how we provide care, right? So you can see that um, it's by providing the care using their values and preferences, right? And so using their cultural values, right? So when you see here, like we, I try to pair for you the elements that we have in the care with the elements that are sort of like the pillars of health equity, right? Culturally concordant, we talk about that. Honoring cultural values, familism and personalism, right? So when we were needed to, my dog is here, people. Kunchi, we're not going to play. When we needed to provide care, we knew like, Familism was huge and we need to incorporate that vision, right? And Latinos, like most of our community have what we call a group identity. So their well-being is tied with the well-being of the whole family. And that's how we create this family parallel care. And it, that it's also like a dual intervention, right? We intervene directly with the teens. We intervene through them, through supporting their parents. We need to be developmentally appropriate, all those things that we have done. And so we became one of the stewards of confidential care, particularly in the time of electronic and medical record. And we can talk more about that in another time. And a structured approach, screening and utilizing national established clinical practice guidelines every time for everyone. And the most important piece is like uh, this uncovering and met needs that I was talking and increasing social capital, but also providing them with case management, provided them with their community health worker that will lead and help them not only get the barriers that they need to get the, down, right? They're their best advocates, but also like navigate our maze, because healthcare is a maze. And we always have this idea of like we're, what we are doing is increasing social capital. So it's like this dual approach of intervening and prevention, and we are not referring ever, we are connecting. And in the next slide, 
it's just it, this is so complicated and it's just for you to have a glimpse and for you to know the article but this is our last um i'll say journey that we have uh it which is bringing this framework the radical healing framework to the clinical practice and radical healing it's trauma center care plus um social justice and it's using all the strings that we are going to talk later to develop care. Thank you, Vera. So what you've done is you've taken a healthcare system that isn't always set up to work for the people we serve, and you've taken what do they need into account, and you've developed a care model that works for them. And a lot of that is about responding to the unique needs that teenagers have and engaging their families on a path forward. But it's also built on working on the strengths of those teenagers. Can you talk a little bit about that? I love to talk about that. And I think like I got lucky, right? Like adolescent medicine, family medicine, and health equity, both of these three are framed on using the strengths and value of the patient, not only the patient, right? But also of the communities that you are serving. So it was like synergistic in a way. And, and I love to bring this to the attention. For one, there's a bias out there, right? About what teens are, right? So, and, and I love this Missing Opportunity was a book created by the Institute of Medicine. And the way that they describe this, like, so thinking about or characteriz the characterization of adolescents and their health status by using measure like lack of health or lack of injury doesn't apply, right? And adolescent medicine is based on this concept of resiliency, right? Where you are using all the skills and not only you are using, you are helping them develop skills and behavior, using their strengths and using their identities. And so this force that is called positive use development, it's a totally evidence-based approach. Where it's different, it's the, where it's been done uh, at the research and translational level at the national level and what we have done in Akiparati, it's bringing identity at the center of the care, bringing not only identity in the intersectional way of identity, but we knew that what we brought not only in Akiparati, but at the national level is the importance of racial and ethnic, or what also it's called cultural identity, and the importance of parents on their, on their development of, their, of that pride and, and that socialization. Thank you, Dr. Svetas. And I know we've got a couple more slides and with watching time, I think we're gonna have to end it here. What I'm hoping everybody has heard is the difference we can make in healthcare if we build healthcare that makes a difference for the people we serve and stop chasing what is funded, stop chasing an infrastructure that was never meant to work for everybody. And uh, Dr. Svetas is known nationally for this work. We had a great conversation one time that she goes, but I'm not known very well in my own backyard. Uh, so we're clearly going to have to do some more of these forums to make sure that more people are hearing about how you make a difference in the lives of young people, how you support their families, and how we use healthcare to make sure everybody has optimal wellness. So I want to thank you for your time and for joining us today and apologize that we're running out of time to keep going because I know we could talk for hours. Perfect. My only shout out is to the foundation and to all our leaders in the support and all the senators and representatives there because the Eliminating Health Disparity Initiative who funded Aki Party from the beginning was the force behind our wins and the affirmation like what we were doing was the right thing. Thank you so very much. Absolutely. And and your last point, uh, Representative Cagle made this earlier when she shared that the previous funding stream was not a grant program. 20 years of Occupy driven heavily on grants, on donations, on philanthropy to make sure that we have the ability to do right. Uh, so we absolutely need to keep our eyes on how do we get healthcare funded for what our community needs. Thank you for that. Our community health needs assessment and Occupy T also show us how we can lead as an organization. It's just one of so many examples across Hennepin Healthcare about how we're working to change the very roots of healthcare. I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're looking to do to continue to serve our community into the future. Together with Hennepin County, we're relooking at our downtown campus. We're sitting in a facility that was built in 2010. 
We have another beautiful clinic and specialty care site at our main campus uh, that's five years old. And then we have this really big infrastructure downtown um, that is our inpatient facilities. And those inpatient facilities are well beyond end of life. It's a big project. And from the very beginning, what we started with several years ago was talking to community to do just what Dr. Svetas talked about, is asking our community what matters most to you in healthcare. What do we you need from us for services? What do you not want so much of? Getting to learn from our community what matters most. And we continued to do that with talking to our team members as well. The process about learning is an important step. You heard Dr. Svetas talk about trust and understanding with community. So that talking isn't just listening and then it exits. We have built that into the very anchors of rebuilding an inpatient unit, uh, the very efforts of making sure we have anchor values that are from our community that says, when you build, don't just build healthcare like it's always been, build healthcare that matters for us. And that is the process as we build Hennepin Healthcare for those that works, for those we serve, it is based on what the community is telling us. On the next slide, you'll see the trajectory we've been on. We started back in 2019 with a master campus plan. 2021, 2022 was those listening sessions, pop-ups out and on the community, hearing what they want to see. Right now, where we're at in 2023 and into 2024 is designing for the future. It is about looking at how do we flip that healthcare system? How do we truly redesign healthcare to transform it? And then how do we take those design principles and build the health system for the future from an infrastructure standpoint? As you can see, this will take us years out. Uh, we are hoping that in 2024, we'll start designing. And by 2025, ideally, you're going to start seeing buildings happen. Uh, what is so incredible when you come into our newer spaces is people tell us they feel seen, they feel valued, they feel empowered for their own health care. And we need our downtown campus to reflect those same commitments to people. Some of the work that we're doing besides just building a building is looking at what I mentioned. It is looking at what are our clinical programs look like. We are currently doing a deep dive on mental health. We know the demand exceeds capacity across the state. And we're working with our community, with our providers to say, let's revision. What does it look like? What do we need to build for mental health, for addiction, for our trauma footprint? And how do we do it all with culturally responsive care at the forefront? In, we will take all of those concepts in 2024 and we will design the space. And that also involves using technologies. Let's make healthcare easier. Let's optimize how people get into care, what their options are. Because a lot of people we serve have really busy lives, lots of other things in front of them. And we want to make sure that they have access like they haven't historically had before. Making our care easy, making it personalized, and making it focused on what matters most. You'll see a header on this slide that says here for the future, equity, community, exceptional care. That here for the future makes sure that we have buildings that can continue to provide the incredible trauma and inpatient care that we are known for within our walls and that we do it with equity, we do it with our community, and that we do it with a focus on exceptional care. When I talk out in the community about this new facility and the new buildings, we talk about making sure this is not a building for Hennepin Healthcare. This is an inpatient facility for our community. It is our community's facility, and we're going to need help as we make sure that it meets those needs. So we're really excited about beautiful buildings. We're excited about healing space. We're excited about openness and making sure that our community has what it needs. And in addition to that, we're facing a lot of challenges. And I want to talk a little bit about the reality in healthcare right now. Our future is bright. It's exciting. We truly believe we are transforming care, exceptional care without exception. And at the same time, our reality today is a challenge. As you've seen the headlines across the systems, what's happening in healthcare has been a challenge. If you look at the cost of doing business. If you've looked at the cost of an expensive market where workforce shortages are driving market competitiveness as a safety net health system, we need to invest in having enough team members, invest in the quality of care, invest in our team members' ability to continue to care for the community. 
And what we're seeing right now is this year in 2023, healthcare is at a crisis point. Hennepin Healthcare alone has a $127 million gap we need to close for next year. That is going to mean tough decisions. It's going to mean looking at downsizing services. It's going to mean we have to make tough choices for our community, with our community. And what you just heard about is in exciting programs that are making a difference in community and are grant funded. Uh, so what we are working on is uh, workplace violence. We're having to invest in safety and security across our campus because of what our team members are dealing with every day. Staffing challenges, staffing shortages that result in us having to pay premium pay for agencies and travelers to make sure we're staffing to the demand that our community needs us to be staffed for. Patients that are inside our walls that don't need to be there. On any given day, we've got 35 to 40 people who don't need our care. But the ecosystem of healthcare in Minnesota is broken. There's no place for them to go that can provide the appropriate care, so they're staying. Right now, we have four people that have been with us over 400 days inpatient. That's not acute treatment. That's a living situation. They're living with us. Think about your family members being stuck in a hospital, not being able to go outside, not being able to have visitors come and go and do the things that all of us have the luxury of doing. If it was my family, I'd be advocating like heck. This is our family. So as a health system, we're asking for advocacy. We're asking for you to help us with your voices to make sure that the state of Minnesota invests in what do we need to keep people healthy and to have dignity and care and to make sure they can get where they need to be. If I look at the 35, let's take the lower number of people stuck in our system on any given day because the supports they need in the community are not available, it equates to hundreds of people that month we could have treated. And on any given day at Hennepin Healthcare, we get about 25 calls for people who need our level of acuity and we have to say no right now. We wouldn't have to say no if we invested in healthcare, if we stabilized the system and we got people the services and supports they need. The travesty in Minnesota is I believe there is enough money in healthcare. It's in the wrong pockets. Health plans are doing okay. Pharmaceuticals are doing okay. Intermediaries are doing okay. Margins might not be as big, but they still have a margin. Healthcare systems, those are healthcare dollars. They are meant for the provision of healthcare. We need to get those healthcare dollars in the pockets of providers so we can invest in the services and supports people need so we can get them the dignity and the healthcare that they deserve. And I'm asking today for those of you who are interested and willing to raise your hand and help us advocate. Uh, Minnesota has a surplus right now. We need to get those dollars into healthcare because you heard my exciting healthcare for the future pitch. We have exciting times ahead. We need to make sure we're here in order to provide those commitments to our community. And it is going to take a funding shift to make sure that we're stabilizing services for healthcare providers to do the care that we need and we're getting people home with dignity. With that, I'm going to transition to Q&A after I gave my pitch. Um, and I want you to focus as we open up for question and answer on the full content of our presentation today. We have covered successes of the past year, as you saw in the video of where we've engaged with community. We've covered the impact of our Whittier Clinic here in this neighborhood, of our community health needs assessment and how we're investing in community, of Occupy T just one of so many examples of innovation in healthcare. And we've covered the future of an inpatient facility investing in our community. And you also heard words of concern about a broken healthcare financing system that we need to change. Our advocacy, one of our team members is here today. Please reach out to us, let us know. And I know that Jessica and Susie would welcome your partnership as we advocate at the state to make sure that we can stabilize the healthcare system. Now with our remaining time, I'm gonna open up to questions. If you are in the room, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll run a microphone to you. And I believe we're gonna facilitate some questions online. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, 
My name is Rosamond Owens. I'm chair of Hennepin Healthcare's Community Advisory Board. So thank you, um, Whittier Clinic team. I came early and I scheduled my mammogram. So I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Go, Rosamond. On a serious note, though, I'm very thankful for you. And I'm thankful for sharing the this these successes as well as the challenges, right? So these are complexities. So on behalf of CAB, um, my question to you, how can CAB support you? You know, the community advisory board, you've been a part of it, is a group of passionate community members, right? So how can we support you and your leadership team in getting some of those surplus funds to take care of those who need it? It's our money. We, we work for the money, right? So how can we support you? Thank you. Great question, Rosemond, and thank you for it. Uh, Rosemond, for those who may not know, is the chair of our community advisory board and has been very engaged with us for several years through lots of ups and downs and advising, again, making sure that the voice of community is what's driving Hennepin Healthcare. So thank you for that. Uh, the, the way that people can help is helping tell the story of we want more of our dollars going to healthcare. Um, we can't have profits elsewhere in the in the health system Healthcare dollars go out and they get cut off and cut off and cut off. And what comes to us is not enough. Our, our salaries are going up across healthcare in a competitive market. We're underwater um, and we'll be underwater year after year for the next three years, unless we change the very structure of how healthcare is paid for. Uh, so absolutely letting us know where you're interested in advocacy. And we have a team that will set that up and will help us tell the story of why the only safety net health system and academic medical center doing so much incredible training across the state of Minnesota needs the help and the focus of the state. And I'm watching questions online as well. We've got the representative back there. Would Hennepin Healthcare ever um, be so bold to come out for um, the single payer healthcare plan or you know, making sure that the, uh, that it's the healthcare dollars are getting down into the uh, to the patient area and not um, going to corporate profits. We absolutely will speak to more dollars getting to the provision of healthcare because I believe it's where people think the money is going. I don't know many of us that believe our health plan that we're enrolled with is making a difference in our day to day health. I don't know many of us who believe. The high cost of medications in the United States as compared to overseas is making a difference in our health. Um, it's making a difference in a negative way, not a positive way. So absolutely, uh, we will stand with the legislature in saying we've got to get more dollars out of administrative overhead and in to direct access to care as a commitment. I have another brave soul in the back. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Alvin Akbar. I am the director of the Center for Social Justice at Urban League Twin Cities. Um, I have a question about whether uh, Hennepin Healthcare System would be willing to also advocate for the kinds of policies that affect the pipeline into the healthcare system. So thinking about like the way that we tackle housing in the cities, the way that we approach things like gun violence, the way that we approach even where we space, like where we deliver care and which neighborhoods have, you know, gaps or deserts in multiple areas from food to affordable housing to health care to you name it. Um, and where that what that looks like in your plan to strategize and advocate for uh, restructuring of our funding. Absolutely. Uh, Elvin, thank you for that. And it's a much more complex conversation. Uh, but our board earlier today, uh, just authorized our state legislative platform that we go in for. And it does include, in partnership with Hennepin County, food insecurities, housing insecurities, addiction and mental health resources that are beyond health care. Um, it is about we've got to double down and make sure we're investing in people. Um, and we've got to have a smarter use of our dollars. Again, I'm a fan of I don't believe it takes more money. I believe it takes getting money in the right pocket. And those are tough decisions. And we can't listen to the louder voices who sometimes have the deeper pockets in able to do that. So absolutely happy to partner with you. Um, and I would say there's a lot of work doing that. You you mentioned the violence we're seeing as a trauma one center. Uh, we're seeing penetrating injuries that are coming through at an alarming rate. Um, and they are devastating to our community. Part of our new facility is I want community healing space. So when something awful happens, our community isn't healing out on a sidewalk, they're healing within our walls because it's their community hospital. 
And part of that is we have the next step program. Uh, next step is investing in let's reduce the recidivism. Let's prevent it from happening to begin with. Let's be out in community, arming people with resources, supports, and positive healthy reactions to what's going on so that we do better as a community. All of that takes money. Next step, by the way, is city, county, state grant funding. And over and over again, they come to us and they go, this grant is ending and we've got a gap and we got to get back in there. Uh, so sustainability and investment in what our community needs to be well is beyond healthcare and it will take us partnering together. Happy to do that. I'm going to have somebody double check me because I'm not seeing any questions come in from the forum online. Okay. I just want to make sure it's not a user error because there's a reason they didn't put me on the technology committee for the new building. All right. Anything else in the room? Okay. Let me thank again the Whittier Clinic for hosting this today. Um, and let me thank all of you for coming out. Um, for those who have joined us online, I heard we had about 85 registered online. For those who came into the room today, community coming together is what will make a difference. And we are all aligned with our values, with our efforts. Uh, we can be the voice that leads us into the future. So here for the future, equity, community. Let's get it done. Thank you, everyone.